Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association webinar, Understanding the Fundamentals of Real Estate Valuation in a Social Housing Environment. I'm Kristen Holinsky, Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives here at CHRA, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. So thank you all for joining us. Before I begin, I'll give a brief overview of the webinar technology. I'll then introduce our speaker and agenda for this afternoon's presentation. Today's webinar is taking place in real time. You should now be able to see a title screen of today's presentation and be able to hear me via your computer speakers, headset, or through your telephone if you've chosen to dial in. We're currently all muted and we do this to minimize background noise. However, if you wish to ask questions, which we strongly encourage you to do, you may do so by typing your question into the dialog box on the webinar control panel, and you can do this at any time during the presentation. We will address questions throughout the webinar, so if you have a question, please do type it in. And we'll also address questions during the Q&A at the end of the webinar as well. If at any point you're having problems with the technology, please call Mark Hughes at the CHRA office. His contact information is available in the text box on your screen, but he can also be reached at 613-594-3007, extension 19. Moving on to the agenda for today, CHRA is pleased to have with us Nathalie roy patneau Director Counselor of Professional Practice with the Appraisal Institute of Canada. Natalie will discuss with us the fundamentals of real estate valuation and how it can help you to make more informed decisions regarding your real estate portfolios. Whether you're looking to refinance, assess market rent, make capital expenditures, sell or purchase in the nonprofit and social housing sectors, or assess the feasibility of converting or developing a project, this webinar will delve into how a valuation expert could be instrumental to your team to help maximize your real estate assets. And I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our presenter, who is Nathalie roy Patno, uh, Director, Counselor of Professional Practice with the Appraisal Institute of Canada, or the AIC. Nathalie joined the AIC in 2012 and is responsible for promoting and administering the Institute's professional practice process and for ensuring that the work performed by the membership is in accordance with the Code of Conduct and the Canadian Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. Her business area is responsible for overseeing AIC's disciplinary process, and Natalie has been called to testify as an expert witness and advocate at professional practice hearings. Natalie began her career as a fee appraiser with Pigeon Roy Appraisal Limited. She achieved the Canadian Residential Appraiser and Accredited Appraiser Canadian Institute designations through the Appraisal Institute of Canada in 96 and 2000, respectively. In 1999, Natalie joined the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, where she specialized in the valuation of retirement homes, long-term care facilities, and affordable housing projects. She brings extensive expertise in the area of mortgage loan insurance, assisted housing, and strategic planning. And over the course of her appraisal career, uh, she's acquired experience in the valuation of residential, rental, commercial, industrial, institutional, and agricultural properties. Uh, She's delivered a number of presentations to AIC provincial and local chapters, including in the areas of professional practice, ethics, fraud prevention, and understanding the fundamentals of real estate valuation. She holds the Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Ottawa and is fluently bilingual. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Natalie, and the floor is yours. We're very excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. Uh, the Appraisal Institute of Canada is certainly quite pleased to have been invited to uh, to participate in CHRA's uh, webinar series and sessions. Today's presentation will focus on the fundamentals of, of valuation, but in the context of social housing and understanding the value uh, of an appraisal report and the kind of information that you can get um, out of a report and the, the type of expertise that you can have from a valuation professional. But before we begin, here's some background on the Appraisal Institute of Canada. We were founded in 1938 uh, and we are now the uh, premier valuation association in Canada. We have over 5,200 members across the country. We have representation and provincial affiliates from coast to coast in every province and territories across the country. Um, In some jurisdictions, such as Alberta, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, the appraisers must be licensed under their respective real estate councils to practice. What this means is that anyone practicing in those jurisdictions, even if they are designated with the Appraisal Institute of Canada, they are required to have a license uh, from the province to practice. And it's not only an appraiser who is residing in those jurisdictions, but also, let's say myself, I'm in Ottawa, and I'm being called upon to appraise a property in Alberta. In order for me to 
leave Ontario or Ottawa and to go inspect the property and to do work and to appraise a property in Alberta, I need to have proper licensing um, from the Alberta jurisdiction. In this case, it would be the Real Estate Council of Alberta and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have their own uh, um, associations and the two associations in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick are actually AIC's affiliates and so AIC's affiliates in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick have been granted the authority to issue licensing for valuation professionals in those two provinces. We have uh, a very rigorous accreditation process that's a combination of a university degree, applied experience, uh, interview, exit interview, and also a review of uh, work product that's done along the way. And we have two designations. One is the Accredited Appraiser Canadian Institute, which is the AACI, and the other is the Canadian Residential Appraiser CRA. Uh, the scope of the two is slightly different. The CRA is, is geared to doing uh, appraisals of real residential properties um, up to four uh, self-contained units or land that would be primed for residential developments up to four units. If a designated CRA is doing work that is on properties that's other than residential up to four units, they need to have their work co-signed by an AACI. The AACI is an individual that holds the senior designation of the Appraisal Institute of Canada and they can actually appraise any property type, be it residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, agricultural, land, special use or other of any building type or building size. And so it's the most senior designation but a CRA and an AACI can co-sign uh, reports together, especially if the work is beyond the scope of the CRA designation. So depending on your property type, you would be seeking um, individuals with those different credentials and you can actually find an appraiser on AIC's website. If you go to our website at www.aicanada.ca, as you see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen or of the slide, we have a feature called Find an Appraiser and it allows you to find a valuation expert in your area and in some cases depending on the specialized nature of the property or the assignment we may you may find yourself having to go maybe a little bit beyond your immediate area if the expertise isn't there and on the website you have the opportunity to search by specialty as well so if you're searching for seniors housing if you're searching for long-term care facilities or rental any type there's also that ability to search by uh, specialty now uh, the benefit of having a qualified AIC professional on your team of experts. As a designated appraiser, be it residential or a CRA or an AACI, valuation expert brings independent and unbiased opinion to the process. We, the fee of the, an appraiser is compensated based on a fee for the work that's being done. They're not being compensated as a percentage of uh, the outcome of the analysis or on the value that's being determined. And uh, we are highly recognized professionals, highly recognized by the courts because of the independence and objectivity that we bring to a process. And that's very important when you're looking for someone, a professional, to advise you um, and to really be objective in the work that they are doing. We have a number of professional services that our members can provide and these include appraisals which is providing an opinion of value on a property, uh, technical reviews where they uh, can review the, uh, to do a technical review of another appraiser's work. This is very common in uh, litigation environments or where there might be negotiations, arbitration, expropriation where the two parties each get an appraisal and then the parties will exchange reports and having their respective appraisers critique uh, and what we call do a review of the other appraisers work. Consulting, this is where uh, our experts can really advise on feasibility, market analyses and so on and I'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation but certainly from a consulting perspective there's a broad range of, of expertise and knowledge and insights that an appraiser can 
um, can bring uh, to the table and to really work with you as you're looking at, especially if you're looking at redevelopment, conversions, renovations, even acquisition of properties. There's not just the valuation aspect of it, but there's a number of uh, a number a uh, wide range of expertise that they can bring from a consulting perspective. Reserve fund studies, uh, very important if you're looking to plan the amount, your expenditures over time and to determine the amount of reserves or capital reserves that you need to set aside to undertake those repairs or those renovations over the life expectancy of the systems, of the structure, of the building, and so on. And this can touch on things such as systems, heating, cooling systems, windows, um, the exterior finish, parking garages, anything that is structural about the property and it's a really good opportunity to have an expert determine the life expectancy of a structure or a system and to determine the amount of reserves that need to be set aside based on when we can expect to do these repairs. So it's certainly a very um, uh, um, good uh, advice to have when you're planning your financial statements and you're planning your reserves in anticipation of it and, and also planning your operating expenses to make sure that you don't end up in a given year or a particular year where you have to spend um, lots of money that wasn't anticipated and so this is an opportunity to get an assessment of the structure to determine how much money needs to be set aside and when it would be spent. And then we also have valuation of machinery and equipment. Depending on your type of facility, there may be some equipment that is uh, part of, uh, of your operations that need valuation as well. Or you might be looking at purchasing equipment uh, for, and then to have it financed and so on. And so our appraisers are certainly um, qualified and have the qualifications to undertake this type of work. And this can be for a variety of properties, as you can see here, it can be residential dwellings, rental properties, co-ops, seniors housing, special purpose properties, vacant land and excess land, uh, land for redevelopment, and this is where we're getting into um, you know, special projects and the development of new projects into specific areas so really getting an understanding of what the highest and best use of that land is or the excess land, how you can use that excess land. And if you're looking for a redevelopment, again, what is the highest and best use of that site? And when we talk about highest and best use, it's about that use that will generate the highest return based on what the zoning and the municipality will allow in terms of development or redevelopment. Others, uh, ex uh, property or expertise uh, go into leased lands, new constructions, property conversions, and so on. There's a number of services that can be provided, uh, feasibilities, and some of them actually can be uh, part, part of um, a particular assignment where an appraiser will do a feasibility and a study, a cost-benefit study, a market analysis, all as part of the same assignment. So you're looking to convert a project into something bigger or maybe of higher density. The appraiser will do a feasibility analysis of, of your project, will look at the cost benefit of doing that conversion and doing a market analysis to determine uh, what the, first of all, the supply and then to determine from an income perspective the potential, the potential income and uh, the overall return of, of that new project in relation to the investment that you're looking to put in. Market rent studies are very important when we're looking to determine market rent um, and also in social housing uh, projects you have uh, social housing agreements that might will set rents, you have a mix of market and non-market rent and so doing a market rent study would be beneficial if you've got market rent units and that's something that the appraiser can provide as well. Reserve fund studies I've talked about, tax assessment appeals, depending on your structure or your ownership. Um, if you're, uh, you know, you, the appraiser can determine the value of a property in terms, in relation to uh, the taxes. And so an appraiser can assist you in determining the value of the property if you're looking to appeal the value that's been determined by the tax authorities. 
Default management, if a project becomes in arrear or is has the potential of maybe going into arrears, how do we manage um, the the risk and or the avoidance of, of default? And uh, an appraiser can provide, again, valuation for in the event of default, what would the project would do, what the value of the project would be, and so on. Asset and portfolio management, again, as part of valuing, valuing the assets and the collateral. I mentioned also about situations of arbitration, mediation, and negotiation. This is where the expertise can come in in terms of the value of the property. They are also able and qualified to provide expert testimony and litigation support. So wherever uh, we might find ourselves in a contentious situation and the value is being disputed, the appraiser may have provided an opinion of value for a specific purpose and now the situation is escalated into a more litigious uh, situation and the appraiser is called upon to testify and to speak to the work that they've done and again providing maybe advice on due diligence and best practices as uh, from a consulting perspective. So whatever your needs, having a valuation professional that provides independent and objective advice and guidance and expertise is important. It can be anything from acquisition, so buying or selling a property, renovating, uh, retrofitting, and also for financing purposes. You're looking to finance or refinance, you're looking to build, to rebuild, um, anything that affects value, anything that um, where someone requires the value or an opinion of value on the property to make a decision, um, be it for, uh, as I mentioned, for financing and so on. I would advise oftentimes when someone is looking to finance a project or refinance or to get some financing for improvements and so on, um, they will go to, they will hire an appraiser and then bring the appraisal to the lending institution. If you know which lending institution you're working with, it's, it's, it's important to have the conversation with them to understand what their appraisal requirements might be. Um, the appraiser, because you can hire the appraiser and say, okay, we would like an estimate of market value of the property as of today, we're going to the bank. But the bank itself may have some specific requirements as well. Um, and so having that conversation with the lender or the financial institution in terms of their, the level of information or maybe information needs with regards to the financing would be helpful because those are things that the appraiser can address while they're doing the work as opposed to maybe finding out after the fact that perhaps the lender uh, would be interested in specific information. So it just makes the scope of the work a little bit more refined and detailed but at the same time, it, it, it ensures that, we're, that you're, kind, you're um, covering off all the bases right from the get-go, as opposed to maybe finding out after the fact what the lender might be looking for. When we talk about here about current, retrospective, prospective, or an update, these are different types of appraisals that an appraiser can do. When we talk about current, it means that the appraiser will give you a value of the property as at today. It's the current value of the property. Retrospective is where we're looking for the value of, a pro of the property at a prior, uh, at an earlier date, and so before today, and so we're going back in time, and this could mean that you would need the value of the property of three years ago, for example. Uh, prospective is a value in the future. Let's say you're looking at a new development and we want to know what the value of the property will be in three years from now once it will be complete and maybe occupancy is at a certain percentage or we've uh, you know the absorption rate in terms of the take up or the number of units rented is at a certain level uh, we want to know what that value will be once we've achieved let's say 85 percent occupancy and so that too is sometimes a requirement from lenders or from uh, institutes and so on in terms of if we estimate the value of the property today, but what would be the value at time of completion if we're expecting it to be a little time at a later time and the prospective value is kind of the crystal ball thing where you're looking at the market conditions and what you might expect things to happen or market conditions to be like over the period of construction to determine what or how the value could be impacted at time of completion. 
and it becomes important if when looking at competition what other projects and so we would look maybe at building permits what other projects are in the queue what is in in the process of being um, uh, proposed in the marketplace so that when we're fully built in 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 three years or two years from now what's the competition going to look like for us because the value of the project today you might not have any competition and the value is is can be quite you know can be quite strong because you have a unique um, concept or project in a market that's undersupplied but in three years from now that may not be the case and so a prospective value provides a good indication of where you might be at time of completion based on certain assumptions. An update is where if you've had an appraisal done, let's say a year ago on a particular property and you want the appraiser to appraise it again um, for maybe, you know, for all, maybe you want to, um, you purchased it and now you want to do some renovations and so they would do an update of a prior appraisal. So these are different types of appraisals and value components that an appraiser um, can assist you with. Um, also insurance claims in the event of uh, fire or damages and so on, insurance companies will often ask the appraisers to determine the reproduction cost new if there's been an insurance claim. And, uh, and there's a whole, so much more, and this is what we call intended uses. And so the, the, um, the bullets that you see here is what we call intended use. What is the intended use? of the report or of the conclusions that the appraiser will provide you and um, and there we work from there. The terms of reference are very important. It's also part of what we call the scope of the work. It's important to understand and to define the terms of the assignment uh, between the appraiser and yourselves so that the parties agree to what's going to be prepared. It's about outlining the information that the appraiser will need from you. Could be um, specifications, could be plans, could be financial statements, um, could be um, all kinds of information, maybe um, bills, for example, hydro bills, heating bills, renovation uh, bills in terms of work that's been done and so on. And so, and, and at the same time, they will outline in the terms of reference their commitment to provide a report and they'll provide it to you within X period of time and the fee will be so much and the payment. So the terms of reference is, is the terms of the assignments, what the parties agree to provide to each other to really um, uh, complete this assignment. And there's a very useful guide that we have on our website, and I've put the link here at the bottom of the slide. It's an industry guide on understanding the fundamentals of real estate valuation. And it covers a lot of the things, or some of the things that I will talk about today. It goes into a little bit more details with regards to the valuation methodologies, but really a good resource piece in terms of understanding the process and having a conversation with, uh, with an expert. So things to consider when you're hiring an appraiser, you want to know, obviously understand their qualifications, you want to make sure that they are a member of a strong valuation association such as the Appraisal Institute of Canada. I've mentioned the fine appraiser function qualifications I've talked about with regards to the Appraisal Institute of Canada. We have two designations. There are other valuation associations in, in Canada, they are smaller than the Institute and have different qualifications and requirements. And so you want to understand their qualifications, their expertise, uh, have they appraised this type of property before and so on, and what they will provide you in terms of report. Ask for references and verify the references. And one of the key things is that as a professional association, such as the Appraisal Institute of Canada, our members are bound by our standards of practice. We have what's called the Canadian Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, in short, CUSPAP, C-U-S-P-A-P. And these are rigorous standards of practice that cover both the ethics and the technical side of the services that our members provide. And what this does is it outlines the minimum requirements when doing work, when in terms of their conduct and the level of information that they need to provide in a report to make sure that the analysis is complete, that it is sound, that it is reasonable, that it is well supported, and so on. And uh, so our standards of practice are internationally recognized. 
and uh, and very strong foothold in the Canadian industry. So standards of practice with that as well we have a disciplinary process or a complaint resolution process which as a self-regulated organization is really important. What this means is that if anyone has any concerns with the conduct or the practice of a member that we have a process in place to review the work and uh, and to follow up uh, on from a disciplinary perspective if need be and this is the same as the doctors the lawyers or any profession where we have an oversight process along the way and our standards of practice are really at the core of everyone's work and it is a mandatory requirement that the work follow those requirements the scope of the work is very important. Uh, the appraiser will outline in the report that their due diligence, the, what it is that they need to do to complete the assignment, the research that needs to be done, the inspection that may need to be done. An inspection may or may not be required, uh, but certainly they will indicate the process that they will go through for collecting information, for reporting the data and the analysis, the type of information they need, They'll also outline the procedures and the valuation methodologies that will be applied. There are three, um, three key methodologies, which, is, which are the direct comparison approach, the cost approach, and the income approach, and I will touch on these a little bit later. Um, some of them are relevant, and some of them may not be relevant to the assignment, and the appraiser will explain how they will go about um, their analysis, and also outlining any client instructions that may put limitations on the research and the analysis. So for example, you might be looking at a property and its current use is not the highest and best use and you may instruct them to, um, you may instruct them to, uh, to appraise the property in what could potentially be a higher use. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, in my days when I was at CMHC, as uh, Kristen indicated, I had the opportunity to do appraisal work for uh, within the Ontario uh, region. And one of the projects that I had to review at one time for default management purposes was a project that was about, it was a two-story, so it was kind of like a, ho a motel kind of setup. It wasn't that, but just to kind of visualize what it looked like. So it was a two-story rectangular structure that had about 30 apartment units in them. And, and the building was on the right-hand side of the lot. And from the middle to the left side of it was just parking space and not a lot of green space, mostly asphalt. So there was clearly excess land as part of the property. And the building itself was uh, running at about 50% occupancy or vacancy, whichever way you look at it. But so half the units being occupied. And so when we're looking at this and the location of the project was downtown, and this was at a time where we were get we're starting to get some development uh, into the area. It was a neighborhood that wasn't the prime neighborhood at the time, but because the center town was more developed, we were starting to see some growth into that area of people buying, renovating houses, some condominium apartment uh, build, condominium buildings being built. And looking at the municipal plan, clearly there was a, um, a move to expand the downtown into that specific area. And so what I produced was a value for default purposes, which was the as-is value as it was, and being a site that was, in my view, underutilized from a density perspective and certainly from an occupancy perspective. But then there was also the... Um, actual highest and best use, which at the end of the day was redevelopment with higher density and better use of rental, but with mixed use of market and non-market to continue on with the social housing aspect and the affordability aspect of it because of the center town location. And it's interesting because at, after that was done some years after I left and went to another group and I always wondered what happened with the project and as I saw the downtown area and that area really develop and grow I happened to drive by one day and that whole site had been redeveloped and um, and so this is about looking at um, the potential and and how you can maximize the use of a site 
where um, you know the building was obsolete, was functionally obsolete, it was old, it was dated, and um, the mix of unit was also a bit of an issue because you were looking at one bedroom units. So you're in a downtown where you're trying to attract um, families or you know and so not having two bedrooms necessarily so the mix of units was problematic in terms of the client uh, of the the targeted clientele that you would get and uh, so having a broader mix of units that would uh, speak to the population that's in the downtown area closer to the schools and so on made a lot more sense and and so in this case you know it was a question of not just looking at the value from a default management perspective but also looking at the potential um, you know beyond that as well and what this does is it advises the client into their options and in looking at the possibilities and even sometimes engaging with the municipality and the planning departments and so on, it's not because a zoning or a use is limited to the current use and land controls that a site cannot be developed or redeveloped into something different. Um, and this is where, where we're looking at varying the permitted uses and the zonings that we engage with the municipalities to understand the possibilities. And one of the things that the appraiser will do is they will look at the neighborhood and, and surrounding areas to see what other developments have occurred. What else has the province or the municipality approved in terms of you know, variants that would allow us to redevelop this parcel into something that is um, you know, of a better more better use, more utility, and and maybe convert an obsolete uh, structure into something that uh, speaks more to um, to the market that we're looking to to reach out to. This is a slide um, I really like. This was pulled from the BC government a couple of years ago, and um, they break it down into three components of local, provincial, and and federal. And um, and I, I I like this, and you you guys will relate to this because I've looked at where you're all from and your background. And this is about understanding the different levels of government. Uh, but from a valuation perspective, and that's where I'm going with this. And so the zoning is important because the municipalities will determine and define the zoning for a particular property. Within that zoning, let's say it's R12, R12 we can develop multifamily up to so many units. And so the appraiser considers the zoning. The zoning is, is the, the, one of the starting points of an analysis because we look at the zoning, and within that zoning, the appraiser is going to look at the permitted uses. What is it that the city is allowing us to do or to build on that site? And looking at, within that list of permitted uses, which of these uses will generate the highest return? And in some cases, it could be that it's an alternative use that's not in this list that would generate a higher return. And this is where we look at engaging the municipalities and so on. The appraiser is also going to look at municipal plans or official plans to see what's on the horizon. Where is the municipality going? What's their, their version, either urban development, suburban or rural development? Where is the municipality going with this? That in, you know, maybe in, in the immediate, the current use is the highest and best use and, or it would be holding for a future use, especially if you know that an area, for example, will be rezoned into something different. You might have an area that's currently zoned residential where the plan is calling for redevelop rezoning to commercial to allow more density, more retail, more development with a housing plan as well as that. And that has important considerations because then you're looking at what's the the social, the economic impact and so on of that commercial development into the value of the property um, as we move forward. So local government municipal plans are really, really important. At the provincial level, we set, they, they determine uh, building codes uh, and, uh, and so on. Some of it can be at a national level as well, depending on what it is. 
from an appraiser's perspective, that too is important because the appraiser will um, do an inspection of the property to ensure its, its compliance and uh, to ensure that it meets code. And especially when we're looking at the plumbing, at the electrical, at the structural component and that type of thing, knowledge of the building code and the building requirements and standards is really important. The regulation, environmental regulation and so on is also something that the appraiser takes into consideration. What we don't do and what's beyond our scope is um, environmental assessments or technical assessments that would fall within the purview of an engineer. This is where the appraiser would refer you to a subject matter expert in those specialized fields if they find themselves having to comment or to um, advise or uh, on, on things that are beyond the scope of the real estate component. And at the federal level, we have programs with financial institutions, mortgage insurance, and so on to assist um, uh, financial support either through market or non-market. But um, again, the, everything that it impacts the, the financing is also something that the appraiser will look at. What is the, the, um, the, are there any limitations to the financing of this project? Or is there anything about this property that would impact its financing? Is there anything that a lender would be concerned about with this property? Uh, when if it would come to uh, for financing and so on. So what I want to bring to your attention is how an appraisal report can help you mitigate different risks. And this is about the information that's contained in the report that will help you in your decision making process. And what the appraiser does is basically is we look at competing investments or other types of investments because obviously people have options and uh, in terms of where they want to invest their money. And what we look at is looking at the characteristics, the advantages, the strengths and the weaknesses of other investments in the marketplace. And these can be real estate investments or other. Um, and what they communicate to you are the strengths and the weaknesses of the market in relation to the strengths and the weaknesses of the subject property. So at the end of the day, we want to determine the value of the property and determine where the property sits in the marketplace in relation to other properties. So some of the risks to consider is the risk to access, uh, access to financing, the cost of financing, and the use of debt to finance an investment. Uh, so this is really important when we're looking at the feasibility of having a project finance, where the financing can come from, and, and some of the partnerships that may be required to finance the property. Uh, one of the risks would be the default, the risk that the, the proponent would default on the project, their inability to repay uh, the loan or to fulfill their obligations if their rates change. And this is where we look at the rate sensitivity uh, uh, you know, from the lender's perspective is what they would look at in terms of in relation to the collateral. And this is where the property, the lender or a, a lending institution is going to look at the equity that is in the project in relation to how much is mortgaged and to the value of the property. And this is where the value of that equity of that asset becomes really important. The capital market risk is the risk that the, um, the property will be affected by overall competing investments. And so this is where the appraiser is going to do as part of their market analysis and uh, look at similar properties that have sold or transacted in the area to determine the market value of the, of the property. This can also be an issue or a consideration when doing a market rent analysis where we're looking at similar properties around the market rents or non-market rents that are being charged and the appeal and the marketability of the subject project. And one of the key things when you're in a rental property or rental uh, with a rental asset is looking at the mix of the units, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, how many of each, the mix of each, and to look at the overall income potential of the project as one thing, but the other looking at the demand in the marketplace for a one bedroom versus a two or versus a three bedroom because the appraiser is going to consider that in terms in defining their vacancy rate. 
because we determine the gross potential income that a project can generate assuming everything is rented at 100%, but what is what would be the impact of not having 100% occupancy and where can we expect or do we anticipate that we will see those vacancies with which unit and for how long? Environmental risk is the risk that the market value of the property will be affected by its uh, physical environment. So these could be um, hazards issues uh, and any costs associated with remediation and so on and that can be costly and so it's important to understand uh, the environment where the property is located and so on and that's critical for redevelopment sites and this is where an, an appraiser might refer you to uh, an engineer for uh, soil testing and, and, and so on and an environmental assessment is also something that a lender might ask of you and so an appraiser might do an appraisal on the assumption that the property is free and clear of any environmental issues and in the event that any were disclosed or uh, revealed that uh, they would reserve the right to review. In other cases you might already have an environmental assessment that might say green light we're good to go or you might have an environmental assessment that will highlight some issues and with a, a cost to cure and the appraiser will then be able to take that into consideration as part of doing their appraisal so one of the things they might ask you is if you have done an environmental assessment before so that they can determine whether that comes into play at this time when they're doing the appraisal or not the legislative risk, this is, you know, the risk that um, uh, beyond our control that legislation, be it local, provincial or federal, will change that will impact the property. Changes to building codes, for example, um, changes to zonings. Uh, we have situations where a zoning will change for a particular site or a particular area and now our property becomes what we call legal but non-conforming and the use that is legal but non-conforming means that it is legal it's permitted it's legal because at the time that it was built it was allowed the zoning allowed it it is now non-conforming because the zoning is changed and it doesn't conform to the current requirements but in its current state this property is legal and conforming however if you wanted to redevelop or maybe even expand on, you know, like, um, and, and build and add to the project, you may not be able to, or there may be some limitations or restrictions to any other changes because of the change in land use controls and so on. So these are things that become really important when we're looking to renovate, to retrofit, to rebuild and convert and so on if the zoning and permitted uses have changed over time um, that would be an important consideration and the other one uh, which in, in my view is probably one of the most important ones is management risk and this is the the management of the of the project to make sure that we have management that is knowledgeable that is competent that is active that is present that is proactive um, to really assist you in meeting your financial goals your occupancy goals, your social goals, and, and so on. And, and this is really important because management can impact the occupancy, which obviously from a valuation perspective has an impact because we're looking at turnover, we're looking at occupancy, we're looking at maintenance. There's all sorts of things that we look at um, which often are, are very much linked with the management of, of the property. So we've talked about market risk um, in terms of uh, this is changes in the marketplace that can affect value, can affect the rent and the net operating income, can be influenced by the location of the property. Um, something has changed in the area which makes the project less appealing or maybe less accessible to uh, your target um, clientele and that can impact the marketability or the rentability of your project. Liquidity is um, the difficulty in converting the asset into cash and how long it would take basically to sell the project uh, in terms of if we have to dispose of it and at what cost. And marketability again is where your property sits in the marketplace in relation to the other properties and its overall appeal. 
So I touched a little bit on the zoning and uh, the zoning is important because it tells us how what we can build, how big we can build, which is the density, the way the land can be used. Uh, analyze any effects on land use controls. I've talked about that. The effect of any probable changes due to regulations, an example of going from residential to commercial. Um, so these are all the kinds of things that an appraiser will look at and study and analyze and take into consideration in their analysis. And some of these things at the end of the day can impact the highest and best use analysis. Um, they might come up with a very different conclusion based on what's, um, what is expected. It can influence the scope of the work and the type of information and research that they would do and ultimately maybe impact the value. The zoning as well, what it does is, is in addition to the density, is they will set um, some guidelines with regards to parking requirements, number of parking spaces for a particular type of property in a particular area. In downtown, you might find that there is less parking space uh, because of access to public transit, because of the downtown location, because of the size of the lot. There's all kinds of things that can uh, impact parking, for example. Access to the site, distance between the building and the lot lines, the setbacks, which is going to tell you how small or how big you can build. So the, the zoning information becomes a critical, critical part of the planning process if you're looking to build, to redevelop, to convert, to expand, and so on. And this is where having an appraiser um, as part of your team of experts becomes important because they can advise you as to the impact of any of these changes or restrictions on your project and your plans and so on. So the highest and best use, as I indicated, is that use of the site that will generate the highest return as at the effective date of the appraisal. And the effective date of the appraisal is the date that we are looking to establish the value. It's a point in time value, which as I indicated can be current, could be in the past, can be in the future, or can be an update from a previous appraisal. And so when we're looking at the highest and best use, we're looking at two things. We're looking at the land as a vacant, and we're looking at the highest and best use of the property improved. And so the appraiser has to um, analyze what is legally permissible, what is physically possible, what is financially feasible, and what is most productive. And what legally permissible is what's permitted under the zoning. What is it that the zoning allows me to do? Based on the zoning and based on the shape of the site and where I'm located, what is physically possible? What, is, what I, can I physically build on this site and how high or how big from a density perspective? Is it financially feasible? I'm looking to spend X amount of money to redevelop or to renovate or to retrofit a particular project. What is my cost-benefit analysis, my cost-benefit and overall return if I'm going to spend $500,000 or a million dollars on a project? Will I be recovering that and, and in over what period of time, how long will it take for me to recover that? What's my return over time? And this is where is it productive, maximally productive at the end of the day for me to undertake this project from a cost-benefit return perspective. And that's the kind of advice that an appraiser will give you in doing um, a highest and best use analysis and in considering your needs and your objectives and so on. So new construction can be costly, as you know. Um, there are a number of, of elements that come into play. Cost overruns is, is very common in new construction. And this is where you need to have good planning, a good project manager, and um, a really good understanding of, of the process and of the, the individuals and their qualifications who will be part of the process. And what the appraiser is going to look at is going, they're going to look at the cost to build this project in terms of determining value by the cost approach and then they will also look at determining the value by the direct comparison approach which is the market approach to determine um, you know, its, its value in the marketplace. And this is one where oftentimes, depending on the type of project, that the cost can be much higher than the 
uh, value, the market value, or the return, or they will determine through a discounted cash flow or other income projection how long it will take to recover your investment. And one of the key challenges over the last few years has been the development of rental uh, properties and multifamily properties in uh, where you're looking at market and non-market rents because you're at non-market rents you're 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 not looking at the high market potential and so there's a discount that comes in for a certain number of units that um, sort of diminishes the overall income potential and so in relation to the cost the value by the income approach and and by the market uh, there could be a significant gap between the two and and so this is where the feasibility comes in the feasibility analysis and looking at how can we um, optimize our costs to uh, optimize our return in as short a period of time as possible and one of the challenges uh, one of the projects I recall when uh, I was working um, with CMHC was a project where they were looking at building seniors housing in a rural location and uh, some and wanting to do new construction and this is something where you are in a in a different market You've, you're in a smaller um, demand smaller uh, group of clientele and uh, and it's about achieving those rents to make it financially feasible and this is where partnerships and so on but having an expert at the table to really give you that analysis of your real estate and understanding the potential the income potential your operating expenses and this the the strength of your net operating income on an ongoing basis and the sustainability of that becomes really important one of the things to keep in mind as well is when the appraiser will do their analysis through the income approach and looking at the expenses they will look at the expenses that um, serve the real estate or for the operations of the real estate so there are expenses that you might have in your financial statements for example that are not considered as part of the calculations in determining the value of the property and so that too is a little bit different in how the income and expenses are looked at and analyzed and so again these are a number of scenarios and situations that uh, can be considered and where expertise uh, can be provided by a valuation expert. The appraiser, uh, where possible, will do, as I mentioned, an inspection of the property. This is about, um, it's not an inspection like a building inspector, it's not to that extent, if I can say. Um, it's more about um, describing, collecting information that will describe the project so that we can compare it with other similar projects uh, in, in the area. But some of the key things that they will look at and an element that, that is really important to the process is depreciation. And the physical depreciation will be the wear and tear from regular use, could be things like replacing carpets, um, paint, a fresh coat of paint, and sort of just the general day-to-day -day wear and tear. Functional depreciation could be from a structural perspective, from the utility perspective. I talked about that 30-unit project that where the majority of the units were one bedrooms, and they were small bedrooms. So the units were functionally um, uh, obsolete from, uh, from one aspect, and they didn't allow for maximum income growth or potential especially where we had the excess land so the the building and the property itself was considered to be functionally um, obsolete and underutilized and external depreciation are factors that affect the property that's out of our control but they're affected by the environment it could be economic conditions can be uh, locational depending on where the property is located and so on but these are external elements that affect the property and so as part of doing the analysis and understanding um, you know the appeal of the property and the competition of the property the appraiser will do a very thorough market analysis where they will consider um, the supply and demand zoning as I mentioned any policies um, local provincial or federal policies any rent controls um, if you have in case of social housing social housing agreements 
any limitations and considerations that would be important to the process. And uh, if you're looking at new construction, you know, certainly plans and specifications are things that would be very important. The probable time of completion and, and, and having the proper resources in place, looking at past or estimated financial statements, and uh, making sure that there's all of the information in support of um, uh, construction, renovations, and so on. Now the direct comparison approach is the appro one of the approaches that's used where the appraiser will go to the market to look at properties that are similar in size, in unit mix, in income potential, uh, in location, age, and so on to look at how they've transacted in the marketplace and then apply uh, an analysis. And part of the analysis is looking at the different characteristics and applying adjustments. And so some of the key things will be looking at the location, the site size, the building type, the design and the mix of units, the age and the condition, the overall footprint of the building in relation to um, the usability of the site, uh, parking access or any limitations to parking and so on. So these all of these here are a number of elements uh, that the appraiser will consider, review when analyzing other properties in the marketplace. And as part of doing that an assessment, they will identify how the properties compare to the subject property. So comparable number one might be similar, number two is inferior, where something isn't the idea through the adjustment process is to bring the properties at par with each other. And so if a property has characteristics that are inferior or that are absent from the subject. The idea is what's the contributory value of that characteristics and how much is the market willing to pay and to support it to recognize for that characteristic. And so if we added that to the sale number two that doesn't have it, what kind of adjustment would we see? And the same analysis goes when a, a property is superior, meaning that a property has characteristics that are in extra um, over and above what the subject might have, it might be in superior condition. And so if we were to make it not as superior as the subject, is how much is the market willing to pay in less to recognize, um, to not have that characteristics. And at the end of the day, what we have is we take the sale price of the property, considering all the adjustments to arrive at an adjusted sale price. And the appraiser will reconcile the adjusted sale price now that the properties have all been brought together at an equal footing. And the next methodology is the cost approach. And the cost approach is the breakdown of the property between land and the improvements. And so the first step is understanding and estimating the value of the site as if it was vacant. We're looking at the site as just raw land and then adding the services and the improvements. And the appraiser is going to determine the reproduction cost new, so the cost to reproduce the buildings and, and the improvements, and uh, estimating a profit as if an entrepreneurial profit if it was built by a builder, and the contributory value of any other site improvements, landscaping, and so on. And we add all that together and then we deduct the depreciation unless it's a new building. If it's a new building, there would not necessarily be any depreciation unless there was economic or external depreciation. But assuming there isn't any, then the cost new wouldn't, if a new building would not have depreciation. But if we're looking at a project that is 10 years old, for example, then the appraiser will determine the cost of rebuilding this project new and then applying that depreciation that is reflective of that 10 year of wear and tear, a functional obsolescence if there is any, and any external factors, and determining a depreciated cost, and then adding the value of the site. So what we have is the depreciated cost of all the improvements of the structures, and then adding the value of the site. And the reason why we look at the depreciated cost is that we need to recognize the passage of time, the age and the, the age of the project and its depreciation over time and which is the same thing that's done when we're looking at the direct comparison approach where the appraiser will look at depreciated properties. They will look at properties that have similar age, similar condition, similar location, similar wear and tear and so we need to compare apples and apples and in doing that it has to be reflected in the direct comparison approach 
and the depreciation needs to be accounted for in the cost approach. And so market housing, as you know, is you know rents that is out in the open market, what it would command um, if it was uh, in a competitive environment. Non-market housing or non-market rents is rents that are um, subject to uh, maybe some agreements and predetermined that are or rents that are not commanded at, in the open market, but where a government nonprofit or co or, or co-op, for example, is is subject to um, uh, non-market rent to attract to as, to assist a, tar a targeted clientele into uh, renting units and offering units and housing to uh, those who cannot afford necessarily to pay market rent. The income approach, and this is where understanding the breakdown between market and non-market and the proportion of market units versus non-market units becomes important because where there are limitations, the appraiser needs to take that into consideration when developing the income approach. And the income approach is about estimating the earning potential of the property and understanding the operating expenses as well that come with that. And so a very, very important uh, element in, as the starting point in understanding the, the rents. And what the appraiser is going to do is they will look at the market rents that you have and they will benchmark that against the market to determine if they are really at true market levels and, uh, and in some cases they may accept them or they may adjust them based on what they see as the potential market rent that can be achieved and so it's not necessarily because you're presenting them with a rent rule that they might um, accept all of them they will certainly do their due diligence in benchmarking it against the market to determine the whether they accept them or not. What's really important though when developing the value by the income approach is that the appraiser is going to define it needs to define every income stream. So the rents the income by the the rents, the income through laundry, through parking, other leasing arrangements and so on, and every income stream will have its own vacancy allowance. And the reason I say that is let's say you have a 50 unit apartment building, chances are the majority of them probably will do their laundry and so it's not uncommon necessarily to have the same vacancy rent rate for laundry as rent might be similar but should be very close. But where the parking is concerned is I may have a 50 unit apartment building but I have 25 parking spaces and only 50% of those spaces are leased, the others are not used and so my vacancy on my parking will be 50% and maybe not 6%, which would be the vacancy on the rents. So it's very important to define the income stream and to define the vacancy that applies to that income stream because it's generated from a different source and, and its occupancy is impacted for different reasons. And when we tally all that, we get what we call the effective gross income. Then the appraiser will look at the operating expenses and as you can see this is the list of expenses that are considered from a valuation perspective. And you'll have property taxes, uh, insurance is another one that we should be part of that. You have heat, hydro or electricity, water, repairs and maintenance, this is general repairs and maintenance, property management and then overall reserves that should be set aside and so on. And from that we will deduct the effective gross income, the expenses from the effective gross income to get a net operating income which is then capitalized with the capitalization rate and this rate is derived from uh, competing properties in the marketplace where the appraiser will look at the net operating income of other properties and can divide that by the sale price to determine the rate at which the income was converted into a sale price and, and making adjustments to that capitalization rate to reflect the particulars of the property. And so that capitalization rate, although it's part of the income approach, is also is derived from the direct comparison approach. And this is where going to the market, the appraiser is going to extract the capitalization rate from similar income producing properties to determine what a property would transact at. Um, or what the subject property would transact at. 
And this I've talked about, these are things that are beyond the scope of an appraiser's uh, work, environmental assessment, technical engineering, and so on, where you would want to seek those appropriate expertise, but it's certainly um, reports or expertise that an appraiser would rely on as part of their valuation um, assignment. And this is pretty much a quick overview of the appraisal process, but I think um, enough to appreciate the importance of having an independent valuation professional at different stages of your the life of a project and how we can assist and uh, and so on. And so at this point, I think we have a few more minutes. Um, I'm certainly willing to entertain any questions, uh, Kristen, if, if there are any. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natalie, for that. It was a really interesting and very thorough overview of the role of the appraiser. Um, we just have a few questions here, and I just want to welcome those who are still on the line with us to ask questions. If you'd like, you can type them into the dialogue box and we'll get them out to, to Natalie. Uh, one question that came in just in general, someone wanted to know if they would get a copy of the slides following this presentation. And yes, you will if you check back on CHRA's website at www.chra.com achru.ca under our programs. Uh, within the next 48 hours, we will upload this presentation as well as the PowerPoint deck. So you'll have a chance to go back over some of the slides if you'd like. Uh, we do have a question. Um, Natalie, about um, from the rural context, if the scope of the work changes at all if you're when you're working in smaller, more remote or rural communities. The scope of the work will be the same. Uh, the process is the same and the level of due diligence is, is, is the same regardless of the area. What is a little bit more challenging if you're in a more uh, rural setting is the data. Um, and so availability of data might not be as abundant as if you were in a an urban setting and when we're, by what I mean by that is um, rents for example you may be in a community where there's not that many rental uh, rental uh, units and uh, the appraiser might have to go into outlying communities or make some assumptions the same goes for sales for sale data uh, where you might not have a lot of sales of larger projects and the appraiser again will have to look at different uh, similar communities uh, or outlying communities and look for similar developments in what transacted and at what price and so the the time I guess is is something where the extra time in terms of research and looking for data and consulting might be a little bit more complex or longer um, for than if you were an urban by just the fact that you might have a little bit more data to work with than with a non-urban setting. Great. But otherwise, the process and the thinking and the analysis is the same. Um, it's just the the level of research and access to information. Uh, the other thing as well is you know you can have a community that might not have done a particular. Um, a type of initiative and uh, someone's coming in with a unique, uh, what is unique to the community for example and will push the municipality to go to think outside the box and to push within the, you know, beyond those boundaries. Looking at the infrastructure is really important. Is the infrastructure in place within the community to support that kind of development access and so on. And so this is where um, engaging with the planners and so on, that could take a little bit more time uh, from a perspective of, you know, you're coming in with something that is different and unique in an area that might not have um, uh, done that too often or at all. Great, thank you. We have a couple more questions for you, Natalie. Uh, one of them is, how would a density bonus system with a proportion of units required for affordable housing impact the appraisal process? A density bonus, can you re just repeat that? Yeah, so density bonus system with a proportion of units required for affordable housing. So the... Um, 
That's not uh, unusual, uh, especially when you're looking at uh, a proportion of units for affordable housing. So the appraiser will look at the mix. This is where we're looking at the unit mix of how many are um, at market and the proportion that is not at market and uh, in determining the overall income potential. So the process is the same. The challenge um, is, is more um, in, in terms of data, uh, you know, that might be limited for the appraiser because you might have, they might not have transacted necessarily, but what the appraiser will certainly look at is looking at the market where there are projects with mixed rents and looking at what the the rents, the non-market, and looking at the market rents, what they sort of each go for to determine the overall income potential. And at the end of the day, that's the goal. It's about understanding the the mix of the rents to determine the income potential. And that would be part of the analysis and and looking at, at data but um, it's it, it's a, it's a challenge from that perspective the appraiser might have to make some assumptions but it is not uncommon and it's something that is quite feasible from a valuation perspective great uh, someone one of our participants was asking if you can explain again how the cap rate is determined in the income approach method Yes, for sure. Um, what an appraiser will do is they will analyze the income, the, the effective gross income of a sale, and they will analyze the operating income of that sale to determine what the net income is of that property. So we're looking at a property that has sold, and the appraiser is going to analyze the income expense and the net operating income. And, uh, and in that, in determining what the cap rate is, the appraiser will take the sale price of that property and divide it by the net operating income. And that will generate a capitalization rate. So for example, if I say, I'm just going to do quick math, that the um, property sold for a million dollars and the net operating income is $100,000, and that generates a cap rate of 10%. And so that 10% is what's how we convert the income into a sale price. So if I was to do, so if then I'm looking at one sale, and then I'm going to look at another sale, do the same analysis, look at the income expense, the net operating income, and, and divide the sale price of that property by the net operating income. So let's say I have three. I might have a range of 8%. 9 and 10 percent. So I have a range of 8 to 10 percent. Now the appraiser will analyze, just like they do with the direct comparison approach, they will analyze the characteristics of each of the sales and identify the elements that are superior and inferior in relation to the subject and they will adjust that and reflect that in the capitalization rate. So let's say I have a range of 8 to, 8 to 10 percent and my property is very very similar to the property that generated the capitalization rate of 9%, then the appraiser might conclude that it aligns more with that one and conclude at a rate of 9%. And what they will do in their own analysis here, now that I factored into the, effect, the effective gross income, the expense, and I now have a stabilized net operating income for the subject, then let's say that's $100,000, then it'll be $100,000 divided by the 9% that I've derived from the market, and that will give you my estimate of value. So you're, you're, you're going to the market to analyze similar properties that have generated similar net operating income and to determine what a capitalization rate for a similar type of property would be. And so it's all in, at the end of the day, in the strength of the net operating income. And one of the challenges um, in, in, in you know, some projects is that when you have operating expenses that are 75 or 80 percent of your income stream, then, um, then that becomes, it weakens, obviously, your net operating income. It's costing you more to run than it is to, to rent and to have uh, income. And the appraiser is going to look at similar at properties that are performing 
um, in the same way with higher expense ratios and what they would transact as. And so it's always going to the market, but the capitalization rate is the conversion of the sale price by the uh, net operating income. Thanks, Natalie. And we're, we're just about out of time, so we have one more question, and that is, can you give an indicator of cost for hiring an appraiser, and would that cost change depending on where you are in Canada? So the cost is, um, is, is very much dependent on the scope of the work and the assignment and the project type. So they can vary from, you know, a couple hundred dollars, or depending on if you're looking at a house, to a couple of thousand dollars or more if you look depending on on a larger project or what it is that you're doing so it can be um, it can be wide ranging and and the appraiser is going to determine the cost based on the amount of work that's required the level of research that's required and the amount of time that they have to put into it usually it's it's it would be a flat fee or it's based on an hourly rate but it will depend on the extent of the work that needs to be done so it's very much case by case it's very project by project or project specific um, and by property type and it also depends on the intended use as I indicated and if you're looking at um, you know actual use or redevelopment and so on so it can it can vary uh, widely but what I would suggest is to contact a couple of appraisers to get some references and get some ideas if you're looking at hiring someone to get different quotes and understanding uh, what it is that the, the they see is the work entailing and what they will provide for you it's very difficult to price point it's not something that is sort of a one size fits all because of the uniqueness of each property. Great. Thank you for that. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for today. Uh, so thank you very much to, uh, to yourself, Natalie, for taking the time to talk to CHRA and uh, to our participants about the role of the appraiser. And thank you to all of those of you on the line uh, for your time today as well and for participating. CHRA's next webinar is March 21st, and we'll be joined by the City of Toronto to talk about their Open Door Affordable Housing Program and how they're working to accelerate affordable rental housing development. And you can find out more at C on CHRA website at www.chra-achru.ca forward slash programs. And as I mentioned, today's presentation will be made available on our website over the next few days, so do check back. Thank you all and goodbye for now. <laughs>